Welcome back to Next Stage Podcast, everyone. Episode 10. We're at 10 episodes. We never thought we'd make, the, make it this far, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing it right. We got Mr. Jonathan Chapman here in the studio. This is Ow! our... Oh! Yes. He deserves that. Actually, he deserves a chime. It's an... Oh. Nice. Yes. Very nice. I'm We honored. chimed you in. You can't escape now. I'm honored to be chimed. <laughs> and this is also our first time having an on-air performance. A live performance here. He's going to play some acoustic guitar, do a song to start us off, and then we're going to talk. So, this is episode 10, and first time doing music. And uh, that, that, that's worth noting here. In episode 10, we had to do it right. So, Jonathan Chapman, my hometown hero, is going to play a, play a tune <laughs> <laughs> to seduce you guys into listening further. And then we're going to rap about whatever he brings to the table. Um, Don't count so. on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not counting on you. I'm going to lead you along, string you along, one, uh, one joke at a time. So do you have a tune picked out, or are you just going to let us guess? Um, I do. What the heck is it called? You can, you can say the name after you play it. Around and Around. It's called Around and Around. And is this a... <laughs> Rat cover? <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's that song. Rat round and round, as uh, reinterpreted by Jonathan Chapman. No, it's um, one of my older bands. It's, uh, I think it was a band called Hugo Wolf that I had going with, you know, the same guys I'm playing with now, pretty much. Now, who's Hugo Wolf? Was that a completely, like, an invented name, or is there an actual Hugo Wolf, like a Leonard no, Skinner? No, from, uh, no, it's from a book. Um, the bass player, the crazy bass player, this guy George Bates came up with Oh, that. my God, George Bates. Yeah, wow. he came up with the name. It's the guy that stabbed Justin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Justin who? Freeman. <laughs> All right, that's maybe not I don't know if we should that. discuss maybe such things. Okay. <laughs> this podcast is taking a different turn I'll already. You, I'll I'll right you, off the you. jump, we're getting we're getting into so, uh, dark territory. So yeah, the stabber. <laughs> the stabber by <laughs> Jonathan read, Chapman. Read some book. Yeah, let's call it the stabber. Okay. That's what we're gonna call this song now. Yeah. 
doorways are crashing Wearing and tearing The trouble with truth Stop the bleeding Ain't much left to lose Everything to me And nothing to choose Such a long time ago Hit the streets slowly walking The streets slowly walking The streets slowly walking Around and around Around and around Around and around clap <laughs> yes that is that was excellent that's man. One, that's one of the old uh, that's one of the old numbers that is a great <laughs> tune and i can't help but notice um and i've always noticed this about you when you play you seem to go somewhere else like you're in yourself and you're performing and you're present but you also there, there's some quality about you that seems like Haunted and distant, you know, and, and even when you're right here in front of me, Whoa. you know, I see you play all the <laughs> haunted time. Haunted and distant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how to put it, but it's there's this quality that you have to your music that, and your performance, that inspires that in me. And it's like that captivating sense of drawing in, like, where were you just now? Were, were you thinking about anything? Were you just thinking about the song? Like so, you, you go somewhere when you play. And um, I was trying to remember the words. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's just really. You just I was thinking. going for ha haunt. What is it? Haunt? Haunting and distant. <laughs> Haunting and distant. I was going for that. Well, it's true. There's that quality that's always uh, drawn me in when you perform, when you play, and you're one of the few people I know who can sit there with an acoustic guitar by themselves and like draw the room in. Some people, well. I guess it depends. Full band is a different thing because that's a lot more noise. And um, some performers, they're pushing out to the audience, you know, and, and when they play. And, and I feel like a lot of times you're pulling people in. I don't know if you're aware of that when you're playing, but I, I, I've always gotten that sense that you're I'm getting pulled into your world. Well, that's when it when it's working. Yeah. And what I what I'm what I do really only works if people are kind of shutting up and paying attention and kind of lending themselves to going along for the ride yeah yeah like what's wrong with him you know i gotta <laughs> i gotta i gotta figure this out figure this cat out maybe something <laughs> like that <laughs> so uh, um just to catch the uh, people up um i've known you for ooh, i think it might be getting close to 10 years at this point um, I met you first at the open mic at Cousin Larry's. It was the first place I came to play when I moved back from South Carolina. You were hosting at that point. 
um, and you were doing the open mic there. So that's the first with time. Uh, Jeff Gorison. Jeff Gorison, yes, and um, I, I, I think uh, you and you and Connor used to play some some duo things there. Sometimes I saw you guys play. Uh, you know, you were on electric and he was on drums, and a lot of incarnations I, I think were going on there. But that was like my um, sort of first meeting point with you. And then over the years, I mean, you've hosted so many open mics. You play all over the place. You're bi coastal at this point. You know, you go out to LA and do things, and then you've got your um, projects here. And, and you've always been this uh, consistent figure in the local music scene, both for uh, inspiration and like the mark. We all want to rise to, or at least I, I want to rise to, but maybe other people do you too. You might be going a little too and, far. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but aside from that, you do a lot of. You other, can keep saying all these things. Other, <laughs> I'm totally fine with it. <laughs> but you do a lot of things like hosting the open mics and booking shows and stuff like that. So you're not just a, a performer who just goes out and performs, and that's it. You give back to the other musicians around here by hosting things, by giving opportunities um, for other people to play. So. Yeah, you kind of touch all bases of the performer, the artist, the uh, community, you know, involvement, um, which we like to explore here on the podcast. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I know Jonathan well, Chapman. I'll start that whole that what you're describing is a characteristic of what was going on at Cousin Larry's. Really, it was, it's you know people playing music, coming together, forming bands at the open mic that Jeff Gorison put together. Um, that's exactly the the vibe that was going on there. It's like let's let's all work together, kind of grassroots style. And uh, did he I, start that open mic there, or was there yeah. something going on? No, Jeff started that. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, Jeff started that with a guy named Adam Brandt, I believe, and then he cycled through a handful of co-hosts and landed on uh, landed on me eventually for mm-hmm. the duration till the end now was that a place that you had played before in other bands i know you've been in a variety of bands over the years in this local danbury area um wh- where did you get your start in playing music i guess in general then we'll transition to like where you started playing with you know bands in danbury but uh, there was a restaurant in ridgefield um years ago called gale station house and uh me and my f- friend eric cullerton another guitar player Went in there, I think we were 15, 16 maybe, 15 or 16, and we just went in there with our guitars and played the girl from Ipanema <laughs> and asked the, for the owner and uh, Sorry, asked, school asked school. for a gig. Um, a friend of ours was working there too, uh, which helped, you know. And so they gave, she gave a couple kids <laughs> a, g- a gig every other i think it was every other wednesday i still have the flyer at home i gotta dig it up and yeah see. and uh did you guys have like a like a group name or you just were was it just eric and john it was just, or yeah it was just john jonathan chapman and eric Cullerton. yeah and uh were you both playing guitars at the, at we the same we were both time? playing guitars and we were not singing we really? were i think maybe one or two songs we would get uh we'd get the guts to sing um, like fire on the mountain or something. <laughs> <laughs> so did you start? <laughs> did you start on guitar? Like, what was your first musical instrument? Did you start by playing guitar? Um, where'd you where'd you where'd you find? Well, like if you go all the way like to elementary school in the or- orchestra, I played the stand up bass. Really? Uh, in fourth grade, fifth grade, the best I could, you know. Yeah. Um. Then some drums, drums, uh, with a guy. Uh, Chris Pike from Ridgefield Music. Okay. Uh, he was my drum teacher for a while. And then guitar. You know, guitar was... There were there were guitars around. So it was yeah. it was inevitable that I was going to be a guitar player. Yeah. Because um, just my brother had guitars. My dad had guitars. Uncles had guitars. They were, they were just everywhere. So... So uh, and, and, every, and everybody and every fr- And all your buddies have... They're just around, you know? Yeah. And so um, eventually... Uh, I meet my friend Eric Cullerton, who I mentioned, who I got the gig with. But now we're going farther back. We're 11 years old. Yeah. We, you know, you realize that you can take your guitar and go like walk and like meet on the railroad tracks. And, like, <laughs> how'd you meet him? And, like, how'd you guys oh, from like school the, or on or the what? bus? Yeah. 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 And uh, and we would like 
me on these old like run like uh out of service railroad tracks and play like Bob Dylan songs and Tom Petty songs. <laughs> Where was this? In, in Danbury? In, or in, in, no, in Richfield. In, in Richfield? Richfield? Yeah, like um, down like the Branchville area. Yeah. Where it used to be Ancona Super. I don't even know what's there anymore, to be honest. But yeah, Route 7, 102 area. So you guys kind of bonded over music and guitars? Not and that so- that means anywhere. I'm giving, <laughs> I'm giving people directions now to my old, to my grandpa's neighborhood. <laughs> Um, no, so anyway, but the, the point of that is that, uh, you know, school bus stuff, and we discovered that there was, uh, a, like this, I think it's a horse trail now, but it used to be just an old used up railroad track. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it was like the path that connected his house to my house. So we would just like meet in the middle and play guitar and like sneak out of our house in the middle of the night. On the railroad tracks. Yeah. Man, this sounds like, like some, learning, some like, blues like, stuff. Like that... learning Woody Guthrie songs and stuff, too. Like, you know, really, really fit in the part. <laughs> yeah. And, on uh... the railroad tracks. <laughs> defunct railroad tracks, nonetheless. Did you guys yeah. write any, like, songs? Haunted. Yeah, haunted. Haunted, <laughs> haunted railroad not tracks. Even, <laughs> I'm not even joking. It's, there's, like, you know, old ghost stories about this stretch of... Stretch of rail. Is that why they should? <laughs> that sounds a little dirty. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I was, was about I was, this year's stretch of rail. I was told we had to be, be clean on this podcast. Oh, we do. <laughs> it's all in their minds. Anything that's being insinuated. I mean, not, not that anything's being insinuated. Um, so playing on these abandoned rail tracks, why were they shut down? Were there like accidents? There was a giant... Large Mars, the worst accident we ever a, seen. There was a massive uh, train crash. Oh, uh, Casey Jones didn't watch his speed. Uh, yeah. He and, missed uh, He missed the uh, uh, junctions. Exactly. 17-2. He jumped the track. Yeah, he did. And, and right uh, there in Ridgefield and just shut it down. Everybody died. <laughs> but if they had <laughs> Is it possible that one of those ghosts like crept into you and that's why you're haunted now? Ooh, Jim Morrison thing, thing yeah. yeah. You've got the ghost of an old rail traveler, a hobo mm-hmm. rail traveler snuck into you at some point during those midnight uh, sneak out sessions. I don't think so. You don't think so? <laughs> You're not good at building mythology here, man. I, I was throwing you a softball there. That could have been part of, you know, the, the Jonathan Chapman mythology, but no. Well, there are lots of ghost stories. That was stories. a foul tip. Ghost stories about that railroad track, though. Yeah. That, I don't know. So you guys were playing playing guitars out on this railroad track at night and, and learning yeah, these and classic learning songs tunes. and and hanging out whenever we could and, and, uh, also, older brothers, they got they got bands together, and you know you kind of hang around and steal their licks and bang on their drums when they're like not around and not yeah. in the house and stuff. And it's it's just a, the progression of that, which I think you can relate to in a, in a way. Just you know the well, I was the first one to play yeah. music, but yeah, you I are, know what you mean. You are the older brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is an older one, but oh, that's true. Yeah. So in any of those situations, was, was there ever like where one of the older brothers was like, "Hey, don't touch my gear, don't play my guitar, don't play my drums," and they they were trying no. to no, no, it... mainly because I was probably really sneaky about it. Yeah, <laughs> like I would go into my brother's room and play his guitar when he was out, like hanging out with his friends, but I wouldn't take it off the stand. Yeah, <laughs> I would leave it on the stand. And Is I'd that what you saw on the stand up bass? And I'd crouch down on the floor and pl- <laughs> like it was already plugged into the amp on the stand. I'd just switch the amp on and play the guitar and then switch the amp off and leave. <laughs> you know, my older brother got an electric guitar one year for Christmas. My aunt, um, who lives out in LA, bought it for him. Um, apparently, it was like used in some sort of like '80s band album cover where they put like a, a a glass on it and shot it with a gun and like it exploded and they took a picture for the album cover. So they had all these like chips on it and this like little outline from where the you know ring from the glass that sat on it. There's some story behind it, but he had it and never played it much. But he never wanted me to play it, so I used to like try to like sneak and play it and he would like yell at me or whatever. And there was one time I got mad at him, and I wanted to like like prank him, so I put Vaseline all over his guitar picks, and like put him back on his amp. And nice. Then, then, but my aunt, who's who got him the guitar, she came back for that Christmas with her boyfriend, and he's like, "Oh, guitar, let me play." And he picks it up. He's like, "Dude, do you grease your picks?" <laughs> he picked up like the uh, you know Vaseline all oh, over the picks. So I'm good. sitting there like, oh. that's like the old uh, Vaseline on the doorknob trick. <laughs> So he yeah. unintentionally was at the receiving end of that prank that my older brother never uh, experienced, and um, yeah, that that was my story of playing my older brother older brother's guitar. But yeah, was, you know, there was, and my cousin Andre, he had a guitar 
in his room, same deal. Uh, I would go in, go in there and not take it off the stand. Yeah. Because I didn't want anybody to know I was in there. And was it just like you had a, a an attraction to the guitar, or did you see like How other could guitar you player? Not? Yeah, exactly. I saw Slash on TV on on MTV, like uh, I think it was the "Don't Cry" is the is the song. I think that he throws his Les Paul into like the Grand Canyon or something after this raging guitar yeah. solo. Yeah, and he likes guitar solos in nature. You know, like they, there's always yeah some in, massive um, landscape. Where, November you know, rain. There's like a like yeah. a like a windmill or like a lighthouse and like right in the in the wind blowing and the the waves crashing around or something. So he throws his glorious, guitar. Glorious man, it, glorious. Yeah, man. Like defined epic. Yeah. So he throws his guitar into the cannon. And you're like, that's for me. And I said, yeah. I said that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and yeah. So I mean. So were you like a Guns N' Roses fan, or are you just like big time? Yeah. Uh, Guns N' Roses and Aerosmith and and um, that's like really early though. It's like that's like the first stuff. Yeah. You know, that's the very first stuff. And uh, and then it didn't take long until it was Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jimi Hendrix, uh, you know, Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan. So what got you Stones, Faces? Yeah. What made that transition for you from one to the other? Because. I can kind of relate because I, well, I started out, you know, listening to a lot of classic rock and Grateful Dead and things like that. And then I got an acoustic guitar and then I started playing, um, got lessons from Rob Volpentesta, local, you know, uh, musician, Sacred Oath is his band. So he got me into metal. He's like, you got to listen to this stuff. You got to listen to Iron Maiden and Led Zeppelin and, and uh, Ozzy and Randy Rose and all that. So he got me into metal and then I got on electric and started playing metal. And then it wasn't until I found blues that I kind of switched back, you know, to blues guitar because I didn't have the um, the dexterity for, like, metal shredding. And I realized that, like, well, blues, you can just kind of bend it till it sounds all right. And, you know, there's, there's no not as many wrong notes in it. And it, and it, it felt a little more comfortable because I just didn't have the, the skills, you know, with my fingers to play metal properly. Um, and I that's transitioned how, away. That's how it progressioned with you? Yeah, I was wondering, did you have any, what what got you from the, the hard rock metal stuff into blues? I think it was, um, I started off just listening, uh, just enjoying the su- stuff that my older brother liked. Mm-hmm. He's five years older, f- almost five years older than me. And this and, is uh, Eric? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Local tattoo artist, Eric Danbury Chapman? Danbury Tattoo, yeah. Well, Danbury Tattoo, yeah. shout out to that. Um, and so what happens is you eventually... Uh, seek out your own identity mm-hmm. or at least I did you know but you start out like in just the stuff that that's around you know your big yeah. brother is the coolest person you know so you yeah. like the things that he likes and uh, and then yeah you start to kind of find your own identity I started digging through my dad's music and that's where Jimmy Hendrix and Stevie Ray comes in and other guys like Steve Vai and Joe Cetriani and Gary Moore like real guitar guys, yeah. Like kind of modern blues guitar, almost progressive rock dudes. Um, definitely progressive rock guys, Steve Vai and Cetriani and, and the like. Yeah, and then so there's the there's the blues connection right there. Uh, Hendrix and uh, and my dad. My dad played bass too played oh. in blues bands and rock and roll bands. Um, so he was always showing me good stuff. And then, uh, and then, yeah, and then, so you start to enjoy this stuff, and then you make f- friends that are finding their I- own identi- identities musically, you know, yeah. and they're digging through their dad's records and stuff, and then you hang out, and you're like, whoa, listen to this, hey, check out this, I found this in the basement, like, let's listen to this. Right. And then, yeah, and that's... Just kind uh, of mining the record collections. Yeah, you know, it helps to have cool parents yeah. and, yeah. and, and, and uh, cool siblings, because yeah. that, you know... I think that's definitely the cycle of a lot of, a lot of musicians go through the same thing. Yeah. Well, it starts I, with what's idle, around you. Idle time too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Idle yeah. time, like Very when cool. there's if you if you're bored and you're like, I want to go dig through the attic and like see, like you know what all those records are up there that nobody listens to, like. Let's see what's up with that. And did you take lessons at all, or did you have like you know people show you yep. that were friends, or like how did you? Where was your musical background in terms of? Did you learn like theory and sight reading, or? I never was a good reader. Yeah. 
most of it most of it just comes from playing with people you know you play with people that are better than you play play along with records um, excuse me uh do you but have lessons like, too though yeah i studied theory um russ muma at the music guild um jamie bgian at westcon uh some other, some you know, a, bunch, a handful of guys in the area. Yeah, so just whoever was around who would teach you something. Uh, what? Well, yeah, I mean, I was with Russ Muma at the Music Guild in Danbury since twelve years old, you know, until I still take the occasional lesson with him. You yeah, know? just for yeah, cause just to brush up. Yeah, and it's fun to go learn a song, and and it's you can do it on. You might be able to do it on your own, but it helps to have somebody else somebody there guiding you and kind yeah. of like setting a goal setting goals for you setting the uh the next mark yeah well i know that um even uh randy rhodes who played you know with ozzy and touring whenever they were touring anywhere they stopped he would go through the phone book and find a local guitar and take a music lesson. lesson and take a lesson yeah you know and he's sometimes he'd show up and it'll be a you know a teenage uh, a girl or kid and he'd end up teaching them something but right. he was always taking lessons even on the road that's so, amazing i know, love that even though he was Ozzy's hotshot guitar player, he still always wanted to learn. Always... Now we have YouTube. We can take mm. we can take yeah. a million lessons. You Every know. time I go on YouTube, I wonder why I'm even trying. I kind of like hate old kid who's better <laughs> yeah. than anything I could ever dream of on any instrument, and I'm yeah. like, what 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 hope do I have? I kind of <laughs> I kind of hate it. I kind of wish it was harder to get the knowledge. You yeah. know, like. Yeah. Like you had to crack this enormous boulder open to find this, you know, shiny gem inside. You know, like I wish you couldn't just you just type stuff in and like get a guitar lesson for free. It seems too easy. Yeah. <laughs> and again, it's from it's from some like six year old who's way better than you. And, you're just, and now you're just now you're just depressed, <laughs> sad about life. And... But there is also the um, X factor. Uh, as it's called often so like somebody can play an instrument and they can be extremely competent and dexterous on it and they can you know master it but you don't necessarily want to it's not necessarily essential you don't want to hear them play an example i can think of ingve Momsen. that guy can shred on the guitar and play these crazy classical pieces but like when do you listen to his songs never unless yeah. you're like hey have you heard this guy oh wow well, that's crazy now let's hear a tune and he puts you know? like 20 marshall stacks on stage <laughs> that, don't even, that don't even have speakers in them man. Like, oh. he's, only, he's only playing he's playing through like a little combo off uh, off no stage one does left that, man yeah I, I, saw, <laughs> I, I saw ario speedwagon for free at the i center my friend worked there and they had all these big cabinets and then you see this little tweed amp behind it that right. was mic'd up I'm like that's really what he was playing through exactly like they're all just you know, because they're sponsored oh, or sure. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Those little amps, you get the broken up. Yeah, you know, I'm playing wall of sound anymore. I'm playing through a little amp now. Yeah, what are you had, playing through? I'm playing through a Blues Junior 112 inch okay. speaker. Didn't you have a trainer for a little bit? That's uh, uh, Connor. Connor Andrews, oh, okay. drummer of my band, Three Legged Dog. It's his amp. Um, I use that a lot. Do you have a preference like tube amp or solid state? Like, is that really that big a deal as they make it? You know, like one or the other. If I had to choose one, I would I would take a tube amp. Yeah. But I like I like having uh, both going at the same time. I'm not currently doing that, but I did that for a couple of years. A few years I was running a solid state amp and a tube amp. The PV. I was running yeah 130 watt old PV solid state amp and a Fender Princeton. That thing sounded great. That was, that was the best. That was one of the best. You could throw that amp down a flight of stairs, and it'd be fine. In fact, I did, and, and it was just to test. It. It's like, hey man, I've heard these rumors about you. You're pretty tough, right? Boom, who's tough now? Like, oh man, it's still, it's still going. Yeah, yeah, it was solid, man. So. Yeah, I've experimented with that too. I've run the the Mesa, and then I have this crate two by twelve um, that Jesse usually plays out of. But I've done both at the same time. You know, it spreads the sound out, and you can sw uh, channel switch you to go between the one and the other. Switch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, a little. Got one over there, the AB pedal. So you get the warmth of the tube amp. Now we're getting all techy and <laughs> nerdy. No, this is good. That's Pete Herder wanted some more tech talk on this podcast. <laughs> well, yeah, so you get the warmth of, the, of a nice tube amp and and the tone. But if you want to, you know, take a more modern sounding solo with a, like a, you know, kick on the uh, the B switch and get that solid state overdrive which is kind of just like 
it's just so clean and upfront, and yeah. I don't know. It's something about it that I that I just love. I don't know. Well, apparently Robert Fripp uh, during Cr- King Crimson used the um, Roland um, chorus amp. Yeah, this, and yeah. That, was, that was a solid state. That's that's a and it's a like a famous amp. I mean, yeah, a lot of people love those amps. So, so there's no real, um, you know, one's better than the other. BB uh, King uh, went to solid state for a little while playing, I believe. Uh, Something made by Lab Series. Mm-hmm. He was playing, so it's you know these are some of the best dudes in the world. Yeah. So you just uh, so the listeners who are starting to play guitar <laughs> don't get hung up about whether you get a tube amp or not because yeah. tube amps have a certain sound and a warmth, but you got tubes which are like light bulbs and sometimes they die on you and you've got a certain maintenance aspect to that and, and so don't don't knock a solid state. It uh, really just if you're good. It's yeah. gonna sound good, you know. Right. Through as long as the thing works, you know. <laughs> it's you know it's you can make you can make it sound good if you if you yep. put the work put the hours in. What about guitar wise? Do you have a preference for for guitar shape or style or, or you know uh, in terms of what you like to play electrically through through these amps that we're um, theoretically right, discussing? I'm, I'm really enjoying my I, uh, I'm playing through a Fender Stratocaster into a little. Fender tube amp. Yeah. And it's super simple and I'm really enjoying that. My strat though is uh instead of having three single coil pickups, it has two humbuckers that are switchable to single coil. More nerd talk. <laughs> yeah. Give a little breakdown what humbucker single coil means to the to the listeners who may not know what that is. Uh, it's it's kind of a, a little a little techie, but it's good. It's good information. The humbuckers are the big are the fat ones. Yeah. <laughs> and the single They're coils twice as are thick. Yeah, the skinny ones. Uh humbuckers, you know, they block some of that unwanted buzz. It's like two two single coil pickups uh bound together. Yeah. So um, they give a a, a, cl- uh, a, f- a fatter sort of tone, like a warmer sort of like mid-range. Gibsons very often have humbuckers and have that hard rock sound, yeah. uh, Led Zeppelin kind of sound, Slash, you know, those are humbucker kind of guitars. But I happen to, uh, I like Strats, so I got a Strat with, yeah. I like, I, want, I wanted to kind of get best of both worlds. And, um, and I like having a whammy bar, so... So I so I, I mixed it up. I went with the with the kind of the the rock guitar pickup setup on a uh, on more of like a you know on a strat. Yeah, so get, I can so I can play surf. World, yeah. yeah, so I can play surf rock. Really, that's what it came down to. I wanted to play you know hard rock and whatnot, but I also wanted to get twangy and. Because well, you got the, um, bar. Uh, the name escapes you now. What's the surf rock? Send dudes. Send dudes in the universe. Oh, you mean yeah. the greatest surf rock. <laughs> the greatest surf the rock most band. Exciting, in our opinion, the yes. most exciting surf rock band of all time. Um, Zen, Zen dudes in the universe. Zen dudes and the universe, yeah. How many, how many that bands? That fellow you... that we mentioned earlier, Connor Andrews, yeah. uh, he is the universe of that band. That is, That's a pretty big responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> all encompassing. Is. Man, Conrad, I don't aka think I, Universe I don't think I Andrews. <laughs> That's right. Update his Wikipedia page, Conrad Universe Andrews. Yeah, um, and you so, had uh, Rob, Rob May, Robbie Rubles. Um, Robbie Rubles. Does uh, everybody have a nickname in the band? Uh, Are you yeah. Johnny Rumble or? <laughs> that was Johnny Jewels. Johnny Jewels. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Donnie Donny Pe- <laughs> no, but yeah, yeah. Donny Pearls? Donny De Niro, maybe. Donny De Niro. <laughs> Donny Doubloons. Because those are pirate Donny coins. Donny Dollars? <laughs> I think it has to be Doubloons. Aren't those like pirate money? Gold Doubloons? No? Yeah, you're thinking too outside the box. Uh, I'm, I'm in the universe, so I can't really constrain <laughs> myself to such small things. Either way, there were nicknames involved. <laughs> and... and uh, you know, cheap suits from the Salvation Army. Best those, place to get clothes. Those were involved. <laughs> Shirts just like that. <laughs> Ooh, look at that. Classic. So okay. Um, so from the from the uh, guitar on the haunted railroad tracks with uh, Mr. Cullerton and Richfield, um, you know, instrumental things, and then around how do you get to Cousin Larry's? Well, around this time. Uh, around, around this time or that time? I don't know where we are. 
Are we? Are we, uh, are we? I don't know. Haunted railroad track. Haunted railroad track. Oh, we're going back there. Look, can you hold uh, my hand for this one? Around, because we're, 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 we're on, on the haunted railroad tracks. Around track. so haunted you're, railroad tracks. You'll be my guide time. for the haunted railroad tracks. <laughs> Let us go back in time, Chosen. Um, so. <laughs> that was great. Dude. That was a great team effort. Uh, around that time, I also met Donnie Piero. So, well, now, was he wandering down the railroad tracks, too? No, he or lived. Or is he potentially a, a ghost? He lived in the center survived. of town. Okay. He was not a ghost. Uh, he lived in the Is si- he a ghost now? <laughs> To Too deep. Go on. All right. He lived in the center of town. He made he his way to the tracks. Out the window, man. He he heard, he heard the music, <laughs> learning, luring him towards uh, the tracks. I'm assuming. You know, kind of he, fiance, I went to, I, something like that. I went, he was wandering, I, looking I for candy I went to his mom's condo. It was called Casagmo. <laughs> K- 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 and uh, I worked there as a maintenance man. <laughs> there you it go. You. I was a pool boy so for I a summer. Over, so I went over down there to Casagmo. And, oh my uh, gosh, I worked there. And went into Donnie's basement, and we played. Uh, you know, we played like fish songs. And uh, maybe some Grateful Dead songs. Uh, he was playing drums, and I was playing guitar. And um, <laughs> and I vacuumed those basements when I worked there. And some guy yelled at me for having the radio too loud. He said, "I feel like I'm front row at a Grateful Dead concert <laughs> right now." <laughs> and then okay, <laughs> so did you, guys you vac- Did you vacuum the uh, storage area? It was like down know. underneath, and like it was with like the cages and stuff. Yeah, and like rafters, and it was like very cobwebby. I, I think that's where Donnie slept. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I vacuumed Donnie's bedroom. He was probably the guy yelling. <laughs> Sorry if I woke you up, Donnie. I didn't know there were any ghosts down there. <laughs> oh man, I love that you had every right to yell. I was infringing upon your personal space. I'm sorry. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that's the beginning of a musical relationship that has lasted 23, 24 years. Yeah. So, um, but then, you know, we kind of went different directions. Cousin Larry's is where we kind of reconnected. I was, okay. pl- I was playing a steady gig at a restaurant in Ridgefield called Upstream. Mm-hmm. And Donnie worked there. I hope it was on a river. Nope. Oh, it's just on a road. It's actually <laughs> not even a road. Was it on River Road? Even was it even a road? It was an alley. Oh, so is it bougie? Is it bougie? <laughs> she could have. Called, she should have called it Down Alley. It was an attempt at bougie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we played there, and uh, me and Eric Cullerton, the same guy I was talking about earlier, and uh, still instrumental. Was anybody singing? Now we're singing. Mm-hmm. Now we figured out that. Uh, I could sing a few songs, and when did you start singing? Was it just because your guys were like, "Oh, we don't want to do instrumentals," or were you singing ever on your own and just didn't want to do it in public? Like, we you got sh- such a what seems like a very natural we voice were- that's that's identifiable. Well, did you always know you had that, or were you kind of like? I was definitely trying on my own, yeah. and, and like, it was um, all of a sudden like one day I figured it out, like yeah. how to like project. Was it by listening to other singers? Like, how did you... What was your moment that hit for you when you knew, like, I can sing? Hmm. I don't know. And it, it, I don't think I ever I ever knew either. It was just like it had one day. Yeah, like, I was just, just like, all of a sudden, it like, I doing. broke <laughs> that, like, barrier that whatever was holding my voice in. Because you, you sing, you sing songs, but it's like you never get quite loud enough. You're never quite in pitch enough. And there's this nervousness about it. Like everything yeah. you do ends up sounding like Neil Young, shaky. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden one day it's like I just like pushed it that little extra, that little extra amount of air or it came from the right place or something. And, yeah. and I figured out that I could, uh, that I could get, you know, I could get a little bit of traction out of my voice and I, so I just worked on it yeah and I made a couple demos when I was like 19 I like writing say. songs or, or doing yeah, covers or writing my own songs yeah and I did a couple did you find it was well. any different singing like your originals as opposed to trying to like play a cover or was there any like more imitation going on and then you found your own voice or was that not really part of it I think writing my own songs is kind of what made it yeah. made it happen that was what made it like that that's just uh I guess that was what encouraged me to sing. Because there was nothing to follow. 
Yeah, I was just I was just writing songs since like who else is gonna sing them? Right. I'm I'm twelve. Yeah. No, or, 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 no, no, I'm the older that I, I was I was in high school. So when I first started trying to sing, yeah. So we're talking, yeah, we're talking sixteen, and then by like nineteen, I had I had figured out how to at least put a couple songs on recording. Yeah. And uh, recording your own, or did you go somewhere? Like, how did you get? I these? went some. Well, I recorded on my own uh, all the time. Yeah. Nothing. What did you use at that time? Task, there... Tascam tape recorders, yeah. uh, four track tape recorders, man. How does that work? Are there two tapes so you can bounce things, or what is? How does that? Uh, I think the fancy one does. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were one of those rich kids. Yeah. <laughs> if you weren't hanging on the railroad tracks, you know, getting no. Getting I think it. Just, I think the one I had just had one tape. Yeah. And um, and you could only record on one side of it because it would be. If you flipped it over, you heard the, you heard what you just recorded, but backwards in reverse. <laughs> so you can only record on one side of the tape. But when you find that out, when you figure out how yeah. to do the backwards guitar and that's backwards cool talking, Uh-oh. that's a cool day. You forget to eat that day. You and your buddies are in your basement for like hours, like just like yeah, getting weird. Yeah. <laughs> So you wrote your own songs. You learned you can sing. You got weird in the basement with uh, backward tracks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I and then I um, found your way to cousin Larry's. It seems like that all points in that direction. I don't know. Got a uh, gig playing guitar in a like a maid band kind of for like they all work for the people cleaning like the house and yeah, yeah a band of maids living loving yeah. she's just a woman. It was a band of maids. Yeah. yeah. That's great. <laughs> you seem a little nostalgic about that time period. We all period. played vacuum cleaners. Oh man, <laughs> that must have been like a, 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 qu- a quite difficult to tune up. I mean, did you have to like all things from <laughs> AC and DC like <laughs> power strips? <laughs> You went there. I'm just following you down the track. So from vacuum cleaners to cousin Larry's, how did we get there? You know, a band of maids too. You wouldn't, you wouldn't expect it. Messy. Yeah, that's beer really? cans and the beer cans and the practice. Well, space. I guess the last thing you want to do is never like empty the ashtrays. Yeah. yeah, off the clock. Off the clock, exactly. Mm-hmm. Slobs. Just yeah, <laughs> throwing feather dusters into the audience. No, it was a made band. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you weren't bandmates. <laughs> no, it was um, there was you know a girl who sang and uh, had a manager and they like acquired musicians mm-hmm. and like got acquired. Oh, you so you were acquired. I was acquired, and um, did you have to like try out, or like was it like did, did they post ads? Like, how did you find out about this thing, or did they find you? They went to the music guild and asked uh, Russ down there if he knew anybody in the area that played guitar and would, be, you know, fit the whatever. Yeah, they were looking for, and um, so I he called me up. I got on the phone with the with the the kid who was putting it together, and and. Uh, I went down there and yeah, auditioned and it all worked out. And what kind of band was this? I mean, it was like cover band. Pop, or original? No, original yeah. like pop. You know, they were trying to sell this artist, uh, essentially. You yeah. Know? So you were kind of like a hired gun. It for was that? good. Yeah. It was all good, and they were all. And I met great musicians, and I met. Um, so I met uh, the bass player Danny Carlisle and uh, the drummer Rob Morelli and. They were recording. They were already recording at a little studio in Putnam Lake, New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, and through them, I met this guy George Sampaio, who recorded my first few demos, like legit. Demos. So like songs that you had recorded in the task cam that you brought said, "I want to no, do better." No stuff that I wrote. Like I like wrote songs. Oh, for, new ones. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just I wrote some material and I did some covers too. Mm-hmm. I wrote a handful of songs. And I did uh, one more cup of coffee by Bob Dylan. Ooh, that's a great tune. Did um, Ramblin' Man by Hank Williams Senior. Okay. Um, and so when you were uh, w- recruited or, or, or whatever the word you use for that, so to get into that band, did you have aspirations like I want to do my original stuff, but maybe this is a way to get in the door? Like, what was there any like yeah. feelings of conflict? Like you didn't want to be a side man, you wanted I, to be. A I singer, did it as or... long as they as long as they gave me a little bit, a minimal amount of money. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't really remember what it was. I think it was like you know, 
I think I asked him to give me like 50 bucks for every gig and yeah. like was it local and like, gigs and like, and like 50 bucks towards gas for rehearsals and so you know I asked him yeah. it was very minimal whatever it was and uh and um I couldn't have been, I think I was like 19 or 20 mm-hmm. and was that like you know, maybe 21 so no I was probably about 20, I'm 20 years old I think yeah but um and uh Sorry, what were you asking? I was gonna ask, was that just <laughs> was that just like gigs around like the local area? Did no, you guys it was travel city state? stuff? Yeah. City stuff. It was oh. um yeah, uh Bitter End. We played at the Bitter End a lot. Um the girl's name is Colby Pryor. Sorry, okay. I shouldn't mention that. Um, <laughs> she's I'm sure she's I hope she's singing somewhere. She was good. Yeah. She was good. But and what know, was your experience? It wasn't my kind of thing. It was yeah. very poppy music. Uh, there was like even a little bit of uh, they're you know pressing for some kind of like choreography on stage. Oh, and, okay. You yeah. know, and yeah, yeah. it just you know it just wasn't wasn't the true grit. Yeah. No. Did you learn anything from that experience in terms of playing at those places in the city and being part of a band and the, whatever logistics went into that? I learned a lot. Yeah, I learned a lot. I learned about um, the importance of you know showing up to practice, mm-hmm. not letting people down and stuff because i'm sure i probably missed a few (laughs) and and, uh and yeah you learn about uh yeah just like the way it works Mm because there was like there was uh, there was some organization behind it there was some management behind it and um so uh, yeah definitely it was definitely a, a good learning experience and you always should take if you got nothing going on take whatever is put in front of you. I I say you know because yeah. you're better working than not working, and you might meet somebody that leads you down a road to something awesome, right? Or so. down a haunted railroad track. Yeah, <laughs> where the ghosts um. were the ghosts of old farmers and dead ra- dead uh, railroad passengers. People with hopes that never were realized. Ooh. Um, so when you were doing that, did you have, uh, Sad, did, did, yeah, no, <laughs> that's the point. Did it, um, did it spark like inspiration in you to want to put your own project together? Like when was the point that you put your own project together? When I made together? that, the first demo, yeah. that first demo, I was like, oh, okay, this is, this sounds good. And I played, um, I had that demo, by the way, had Christy Angelis from uh, the bass player of Kung Fu, oh, a great, yeah. great local-ish band. Best. Great yeah. band. Uh, he was he played ba- upright bass on that demo, which is wild. And uh, and I played like I played a bunch of instruments on it. Played yeah. a cu- I played keys because you had already learned drums. You had learned upright bass. You guitar. So you kind of had a three piece in your own. Self. I had an, I had a lot. Of, yeah, I had a lot of things in in my arsenal already that I could that I could do. Uh, you know. At a mediocre level, yeah. not you know, I, I was I was decent at guitar, but everything else I was eh. But I could, but that's enough in a studio. You can make that work. Yeah. You can make that work. Right for most songs, you can make that is... work with a click track and uh, a little bit of cut and paste. Yeah. <laughs> and for most songs, like the back beat doesn't have to be that complicated to make the song. Like if you're carrying the tune, you don't need a lot of flash. If someone's a great player, of course, give them their spot to to let that shine. But if you're just you know working songs your own. And you can just keep the beat. That's good enough, right? Yeah, and it's if you just do it. For, if, you, if you just do, uh, just calm myself. <laughs> good, that's pretty good. <laughs> just be honest. Yeah. Just sing a song. If you like the song that you wrote, and you enjoy it when you play it, you know when you're practicing alone, and you're working on it, and like if you feel something from it, try to get that on recording. Mm-hmm. You know and. If it's good, it's good. Yeah, and so it doesn't then, have to be perfect because some of the best stuff is uh, imperfect. You know, I'm sure you agree with me with some of the. You know, I know yeah. you're a Stones fan. Oh yeah, there's all those. <laughs> well, they're one of those bands that like their sum is greater than the parts. You take any one of those guys out on their own, yeah. not that impressive. But for some something about when they come together, there's a just a sound in the air that that happens. And it's undefinable, mm. you know. And uh, I'm sure that, it, uh, well, I would guess a lot of bands are that way because it's, it's very rare that a truly uh, seamless replacement happens in a band if somebody critical, you know, isn't uh, involved anymore by it's choice or death or whatever. Definitely the big the big groups, you yeah. know, like 
And Kiss is uh, doing a tour right now with only half. Like, is that, there's a thing. Is it two? There's some, there's some beef going on. There's big time <laughs> beef. What's going on with Kiss? There's, Freely's, uh, there's big time beef. And it's like, I don't think I would want to. Uh, not that I'm the biggest Kiss fan. No, no, I'm no, just saying no, this no. just ha- happens yeah. to be. I was reading about this uh, recently. Yeah, so, but um, it's like I if I was a member of the Kiss Army, right? If I was a huge <laughs> Kiss fan, I don't think I would want to go pay Kiss money to see half of Kiss. No, you know what I'm saying. I think that's yeah. the argument with a lot of these bands out there. I mean, like you know, I get like Alice in Chains, you lose Lane. For me, I don't want to go see Alice in Chains. Yeah. It's not Lane Staley. You I know? saw them by accident. Well, not that it's much better, but I was going to see Velvet Revolver. It's kind of an, awesome. a, it's another, uh, but they were awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and I found, like, I saw the tickets at Alice in Chains open. I'm like, what? Alice in Chains? And then. Well, was like, it just Jerry Cantrell singing? Or? No, no, they had the other guy. They had the other yeah. guy. Yeah, well, I was very surprised. Who's awesome. Yeah. I think he's really good. But well, that's the thing is, Jerry was singing the almost. You know, a lot of the time in those songs, so he, you know, carried a lot of that. So yeah. it wasn't just Lane singing; those harmonies were built between them. You, know? you got to think that they just keep the name for marketing reasons. Surely that they they because yeah. as a guy that's been in a bunch of bands, like my first instinct, if I was ever in that situation, <laughs> not that I've ever been in a a big famous band or anything yeah. so I can't I guess I can't relate but I would want to change the name yeah Be like we can still play those songs but yeah. like we got a new guy like this yeah. let's barely change the name let's just like screw well, it with might it be legal bit. stuff though if they legally like under that you know they have right, maybe they have to yeah. to play those otherwise songs. they'd be paying to cover their own songs the, yeah they'd have to pay the record company to play their own songs yeah but, that um, might be why they do it because they don't you, you can't that's why Pink Floyd are suing each other all the time right that's the <laughs> that's the uh, credence uh, John Fogarty yeah. story man got sued for sounding like himself <laughs> yeah how do you get sued for sounding <laughs> like yourself <laughs> that's insane <Yeah. laughs> but it happens that's the age of copywriting you don't own your stuff you know which is a weird thing to that that concept that especially more so in the past people had to sacrifice their creative um property in order to like get into studios to record you couldn't just go and record a demo or anything on your own way back when unless you had a bunch of money to buy equipment and who's gonna run it then i don't know but now that we have like computers and you know digital interfaces that can you can get a decent setup for 500 bucks you know to record your own stuff like we kind of are able to bypass that but it does open the floodgate for everything yeah. being saturated and how do you find anything good i mean it's 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 awesome yeah but it it's is. but it's also pretty crummy yeah <laughs> it takes all that like mystique out of it and like all that work you don't all have to bash character. through the boulder, as you said, and find the jewel. Yeah, all the character that you build as a band, like yeah. practicing you like, Walmart, all right? the time. Just got a yodel in a Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> Is that all you got to do That's now? That's all you got to do. Damn. Yeah, Sounds it's like it's a weird Al song, Yodel kid. in a Walmart. <laughs> you haven't seen the yodeling kid? Copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> Hank Williams, and then he became famous. And I love the kid because he yodeled Hank Williams. I, mean, it's... I have not seen that. But now he's absolutely famous. Two million That's followers. amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yodel in a Walmart, somebody catches you on film. That's it. Done. That's all you need to do. <laughs> That's all you need to do. That's what we're trying to do here, okay? You, Why am I wasting all my time, money, <laughs> and effort? Yeah. This is why we're getting the... Uh, the buying podcast. all these microphones and <laughs> gizmos and doodads. <laughs> Now, that's a good question. Why are you wasting all your time doing that? (laughs) (laughs) But seriously, like, where do you see... Okay, so you came up through a a, a very um, sort of traditional way of learning instruments and, you know, getting lessons and learning from other people, learning from other brothers, taking lessons and playing by the railroad tracks. It's kind of like hard-earned musical knowledge. And and what does that do in this modern age? Hard-earned in a pretty soft environment, though. We're, talk- it's, we're talking about Fairfield County, though. <laughs> okay. So we're sneaking out in the middle of the night on the railroad tracks. But I'm going home and eating, like, PB&Js and eating tro- drink of chocolate milk. <laughs> Fair enough. But you didn't just... You were just yodeling in the but Walmart. But that's where the idle time comes in that I, yeah. that I mentioned earlier. Like, that, it really helps if, like, if you have the... Uh, the availability to the if you have an instrument available to you and a place to practice and a place to hang out with your buddies mm-hmm. like that's 
that's where the that's the breeding ground. You know. What was your first practice space that you can remember as like a real like practice space? The guys got together or whoever. And like, was there any kind of like spot that was like you felt like my this is where we jammed? The garage at my grandfather's house. Yeah. Is, is the. What was that like? It was like a, that's awesome. Two bay garage, one bay garage. Just a regular, a, paint us a picture here. Regular uh, two car garage license. and a ranch house. Yeah. Um, and uh, was it like separated from the house or connected? Connected, like kind of yeah. underneath. A little like walkway con- or underneath. No, so it was go, a raised ranch. Raised ranch, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you go underneath and and then uh, the door. Very popular, kind of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For all you non-Connecticut mm-hmm. people, there, so was he already parked on the, the real estate <laughs> wave of the early seventies in Beverly The Grandy. raised ranch. Uh, <laughs> it really um, came into popularity. <laughs> but yeah, and uh, one one side of the garage was. Um, you know what? I don't think anybody parked in the garage at that house. One side, I think it was like... Was that already fertile. happening? Or did you say, move out, we're playing here? I don't know. I, I think one side was like tools and like stuff that my grandpa messed with. Mm-hmm. He might have parked in there sometimes. I don't know. But the other side was definitely just we just kind of occupied it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my mom was too busy working all day to deal with us yeah. <laughs> to like tell us the so that was move. your hang spot I mean we had like a, we had like a you know drum set bass amps PA system yeah. like you know it's a lot of stuff it's not like it's a little daunting you open up the garage door and see it it's not like move your bike yeah it's like, it's, <laughs> it's like move your life uh, yeah, I don't know if I can do that <laughs> so that was the first real like jam spot oh, who yeah. was jamming with you there um my buddy Eric uh just like my school friends, people that most mostly you know that age. We're talking middle school, so it's kids that live on the, in on the same like bus line as yeah. your school bus route, you know. So you know my buddies, my buddies. Yeah, and were there like like any bands out of that? Did you guys write original songs, or was it more just? jamming on whatever like, oh yeah what? we had tons of bands yeah we had crimi- some, do you remember some band names yeah criminal mischief Ooh. <laughs> grass buzz <laughs> there's nothing left to the imagination there checkmate checkmate <laughs> yeah big chess guy yeah it's a chess themed group <laughs> <laughs> and then okay so then you got into um uh playing at cousin larry's at some point and then how did you um you know well, you're skipping. Wait, where where are we now? I don't know, are man. Are we, we still we, in the haunted railroad? I feel like we've or? gone back. We've, we've gone time has no meaning here. <laughs> you got to understand that when you're casting, there's no meaning. It's all it's all circular time. I mean, we're in the universe. The um, second jam space yeah. is probably the more important jam well, space. Well, let's get on that. The second, the second jam space? Was at Eric Cullerton's grandmother's house, Mamina, Mamina's house. Yeah. And... Uh, is that like an Italian name or something? Or? No, I think that's just what they just called what their they grandma. Called. Yeah. Um, oh, it wasn't her last name. No, Mamina oh. was just Mam- yeah. Mamina. Not Italian though. Okay. Like, um, so anyway, I think I think Mamina died, and we ter- turned her old bedroom into. She might have still been around. We moved her somewhere else in the house, but her <laughs> old bedroom became our jam space. Yeah. And. Um, and definitely continued to be after she passed away. And was, this woman was amazing, by the way. This woman was, you would threaten to call the police if you went outside without your jacket on. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to call the police on you. <laughs> 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 I'm just going, it's like our band's criminal <laughs> mission. Forget yeah. it. <laughs> I'm going out with an unzipped <laughs> going jacket. Going to a tank top. <laughs> um, gosh, she's great. And uh, crazy. She's awesome. And uh, so we'd play in Mamina's room all the time, and those, and that's now we're getting getting into the high school years, you know, maybe some experimentation is going on. Yeah, staying up all you know, night. Like borax and and, uh, and and you know baking soda and vinegar. Bunsen and then, burners. You know, sort yeah. of volcanoes and mm-hmm. you know, things like that. Stained Mento, glass. Mentos yeah. in a Coke bottle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I've been down that road. <laughs> Pop rocks and, and Sprite. Me whoa, in, whoa, whoa, Jump around. <laughs> hey, G-rated, G-rated. Um, Kids, don't eat candy. Brush your teeth. <laughs> oh, boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, in, 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 in this second jam space, some some new uh, creative yeah, plateaus might have been hinted we're, at. Yeah, we're reaching new plateaus yeah. for sure. And we're like, 
feeding the raccoons and they're coming into the house. That's not a metaphor, and, is that? Is that that's a real no, thing? No, that's real. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> not like feeding the raccoon is like a, you know. And we're sleeping out in the barn and we're doing, and we're building fires on the swamp in the winter. <laughs> and we're doing all fires this. Fires in the swamp, we're doing all raccoons. This, we're doing all the right sleeping things, Sleeping in the barn, right? this is like, We're okay. doing all the right You've things. You've graduated from the spooky railroad tracks. Right. Now you're doing yes. swamp fires. Can we swamp fire. Swamp fires. <laughs> awesome, like. I think they fire tore is a good band name, by the way. <laughs> If that was on St. John's Road in Ridgefield. I think they tore it down. Or yeah, I think so. But um, or the swamp swallowed it. That could be. <laughs> Maybe a swamp fire got out of control by some youngins. That could be. Mm. That was great though, and that's where na- now. So at this time, we're in high school. Me mm. and Eric, we're listening to Larry Coryell, uh, who remains maybe my favorite guitar player. Um, and was he solo? Did he play with anybody? What was Larry Coriel? He played a lot of people. He had a band called The Eleventh House. Mm-hmm. Um, he broke out on a record by a guy named Chico Hamilton, a record called The Dealer. Uh, definitely in my top five favorite albums of all time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, jazz f- f- fusion is not the right word, you know? It's a, it's a little bit too light of a word for what this music was. Because this wasn't the music that was like played on the Weather Channel or anything. This is heavier. Yeah. This was. You mean by the Weather Channel or on the Weather Channel? <laughs> on the Weather Channel. Because there's two different. No, Weather Report. Is weather the band. Report. Sorry. But they, I tell you what, they do play a lot of Weather Report on the Weather yeah. Channel. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it's like the same music. I heard like, shot on you, Crazy Diamond, on the Weather Channel once when I was probably really? like, yeah, I was like 14 or something, and the Weather Channel was on. My mom used to fall asleep to it a lot because I guess it was soothing. But I was like. They're playing Shot on You Crazy Diamond on like the Doppler radar. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> they play, you know, every once in a while you'll catch a hot tune on the weather. Yeah. Channel. <laughs> really, this is probably in like, you know, 96, 97. But anyway, so you were digging on. on, on Larry Coriel, man. He's from Texas. Um, he had a head full of plateaus. Hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and Very organized fellow, I assume. And yeah, man, he played. Uh, at least I think he was from Texas. I don't, don't. I might not have my facts straight, but uh, yeah, what a killer guitar player! And um, and I listened. I digested a lot of a lot of the stuff that he was doing, which led me to John McLaughlin and Mahavish New Orchestra, uh, which then led me down. From there, I started getting into more uh, st- what you would call, I guess, straight ahead jazz, mm-hmm. and started listening to guitar players like Wes Montgomery and Kenny Burrell. <clears throat> And uh, Django Reinhard. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Two yeah. fingers, man. Django. Kind of still go wagon fire and just boop. That that music still amazes me. Like yeah. I can't even listen to it that often because it like freaks me out, gets me too excited. Yeah. Like I have to then I, I immediately you want to like lock myself in a room and play guitar for a year. <laughs> <laughs> So that's when you started digging deep into more like guitar um, theory or, or or sort of like mining that um avenue of like true masters of the instruments that were where you were really getting I just, your licks from and stuff I, I just i really liked it you know yeah. i really liked um just the the jazz thing i guess and, or and the guitar player thing you yeah. know it's just like you're kind of like a gunslinger yeah and you know it's there's definitely this kind of wild west mentality to be in the the guitar player you're kind of a dark figure in the shadows sort of like guy on a train with his guitar case or whatever yeah you know, i'm painting some kind of picture here. oh you are <laughs> <laughs> we know where your roots came from you're you're haunted by a, a, a ghost from the the train crash that happened in ridgefield yeah. and he's been guiding you ever since he's like let me show you what i've learned come here <laughs> And uh, okay, so then you're getting you're, you're digging into all that stuff. And were, was there a band at this time? What was there? Sh- we're pretty much just jamming without a bass player. Me and Eric are playing guitar. His older brother Nate would play drums sometimes. Our buddy Walter would play drums sometimes. Uh, our buddy Tristan, whoever, whatever drummer. There's always plenty of guys playing drums. Really, they might back not, then maybe they but might not. not now. <laughs> they might not be good, but everybody wanted to beat on the drums, so there was no shortage of guys coming over to play drums. But um, yeah, then you know, then there's the uh, jam space number three. Oh, we're on to jam space number three. Good. Kind of happened. Volume uh, three. Now we're in Danbury now. Okay. Um, and that's at my mom's house. 
in Danbury. We had a base, a, a jam space in the basement. And now like bands are like practicing there and stuff like that was like that was like kind of like a functioning the next plateau definitely another plateau going yeah. on here and um hang out space and you're in your 20s at this point still a teenager teenager still okay f- 15 16 yeah okay oh so this was before the the uh, recruitment and recording thing we touched on earlier so this is yeah more, this, we okay. jumped a little bit back. yeah we're time traveling we're time traveling yeah, yeah good, good yeah yeah so this is your roots of the, you came up now, now you're now, jam space number three, three is where the real bands are happening some good stuff is happening do you remember any more band plateaus. names in there <laughs> um nothing at the top but a bucket and a mop and an illustrated book about birds <laughs> some meat puppets <laughs> seen a lot up there but I don't care <laughs> who needs action when, when you we got when words, we got words. <laughs> um were there any bad names out of the jam space number think. three there was a band that practiced there that uh that my brother played with a little bit and because my brother would dabble in music too yeah and uh there was a band called the mad chiron mob that practiced there I don't think we had band names really that much, though, me and my buddies. Still just finding your way and just jamming on whatever you could? We're really just practicing all the time. Yeah. All the, all the time. And getting out there, you know, improvising, getting getting a little weird. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then I get, you know, and I'm, at this point I'm getting in the process of getting kicked out of high school. Oh. So. What happened there? Too much time by the train tracks? Too many plateaus. Yeah, too many plateaus. <laughs> and uh, let's catch up with you. <laughs> and um, so now, like, life is starting to happen. Like, I, I tried to go, to, got my GED, tried to go to college. Uh, in the jazz program at college, at Westcon, and I'm getting a lot of heat, a lot of weird vibes, because I'm, you know, I love jazz, I love Coltrane, and I'm like into all this stuff but I also love the Ramones and you know Nirvana and like and so I'm like getting weird vibes not sure not really finding a place to fit in except for with my buddy Eric who uh, is also attending um also kicked out of school for plateaus okay (laughs) and uh you guys had a pension for plateaus (laughs) just plateau pension ascending man you know (laughs) always ascending yeah um, so, you know, and then, so now there's like, now it's like, I'm, I'm learning it, but I'm learning it to forget it kind of, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm trying to get to, uh, I'm trying to get back to like three chords and the truth kind of thing. And, and, uh, yeah. And then, then the, the band of maids yeah. was the sloppy, the sloppy maids. And that's where you got into Larry's from that. And then that after band. that, and after that, after around... that is Larry's. Around that time is, is Upstream Lounge, you yeah. know, the bougie attempt by yeah. no stream, <laughs> by no streams, <laughs> by no streams. Um, they actually it was called that because of the the Beatles song. Uh, Oh, relax and, and float, float upstream. upstream. Yeah. You are not dying. Yeah, and blah, like it was, blah, blah, blah. everything was blue and watery yeah. themed inside. Oh, with their lily pads and koi ponds. <laughs> not that they didn't take it that far. They uh, should have. That would have been cool. It might have. A rotating speaker that and, you know they're announced. Body of three. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> was, uh, that was a great gig, man. That was every Friday for like, I want to say. The better part of three years, we did that gig. You know that that's that's uh, hard to find now. Yeah, you learn a lot. You learn a lot having a weekly gig for that long. Having you know, it turns into a regular job kind of thing. It's no longer just having fun with the fun with the dudes. Um, Now, what was the Danbury local area music scene like when you started getting into Larry's and and, you know the band of Maids was whatever it was, but whatever you had your other bands or things that you were, you know, playing. What was happening around here? Because I, I know that in the late 90s, there was more going on. Yeah, I kind of missed that. Mm. You know, I was I was in the... I was in Jam Space number three, uh, you know, shucking out some Larry Coryell solos and listening to Miles Davis and whatever. Yeah. Hanging out with my dog. And... Uh, so there was, but there was a lot going on in Danbury. There were a lot of metal shows and stuff, and uh, 
there was a lot going on in the 90s. There was a big scene. Yeah. You know, there were shows at Tuxedo Junction and uh, some other venues. Um, and it kind of continued. It had a resurgence. Once I really found my, found my way in, in the, uh, I guess, the... Around 2004, I mm-hmm. want to say, 2003, 2004, I started playing a lot in Danbury and hanging out. It was the beginning of resurgence that I was lucky enough to be. Was that when like the Sub Rosa things were going on? Or before that, that before was that? leading up to that. Okay. Leading up to that. That was Tony Acabellis, who was a great, prom- uh, who uh, did a wonderful job promoting shows in Danbury. Yeah. Definitely brought a lot of attention. So you had time. already been like building up and like you paid your dues and these other things. And you Still were... paying dues. But, well, we're, yeah. oh, aren't we yeah. all? You were, you were getting uh, more accomplished as it was getting into that phase, right? Well, I was just playing gigs. Yeah. You know? And I guess for a musician, that's accomplishment. Yeah. yeah. But from the outside looking in, it's, you know... Well, what is accomplishment? Is it, yeah. is it selling a bunch of records? I don't know. Yeah, I have no Who idea. Who does that anymore? I, I have I mean, no idea. Know. It's, it's all streams now, so you don't even know. And what sells is not necessarily because of quality. It's because it sounds like something another person you know, have heard before. And someone's going to say, I like this tune. And then, you know, it's not necessarily like innovation that sells, right? So, like, what what is really... It earning it or making it or, or, or getting your, your, your dues? I, I mean, think it's just like, you know... With the music stuff, I think it's like, maybe it's like surfing or something where you just have to catch it and like ride it as long as you can and it, will, you know, might end quickly or might not. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, um, so when you were coming, uh, 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 were you playing in other bands when you were going to Larry's and this and, and the leading up to the Sub Rosa sort of stuff, or did you have your own bands at all? Larry's, the Larry's thing was, you know, so Larry's thing was just so I'm playing at up that place upstream. Yeah. Donnie Piero uh, is working there. Him and some other guys say, "Hey, why don't you come on to Cousin Larry's? There's an open mic there." And um, and eventually, I eventually I yeah I. Hopped in the car or whatever and went there and had a had a had a really good time. And um, and that was your and, first time going there. No, it wasn't my first time going there. I'd played there. There had been like a couple of random weird events there where I was playing music um, mm. with some people. That but it was painted like Yankee Stadium at the, th- the back, like before <laughs> Gorison got his hands on it. You know. Yeah. And um, it was a different place. So I, you know, I go in there with Donnie and uh, meet Jeff and Billy Neville, the bartender, and all the 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 people that would end up becoming my best friends. Yeah. And um, and it was a scene. It was happening. Was it like a community feeling developed amongst those people? You could tell that this was done by there was, you know, this was an uh, a. Communal effort for sure. You could yeah. feel that the, the, this is a group energy making this happen because there was no money involved. Right. You know, nobody was getting paid by. If there was any money involved, it was minimal. You know, because right. Larry wasn't. Larry was just giving these guys a shot to see if he can. They they can do something fun on Monday nights. Mm-hmm. Um. So and it and it was really cool. And from there, Jeff started booking shows in the weekends. Uh, other people that were hanging out there would get, would book shows there, book their bands there. I would start booking bands. I started forming forming bands and naming them. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I had uh, we had yeah we had a couple. You know, we did had, you use any like Ouija boards down by like the haunted tracks to like find band names? <laughs> Funny, that's how we came up with the name the Ghost Dance, which was one of our bands from a Ouija board on the no. train. Tra- no, it should have been man. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I throw you another softball for myth making. You're like, nah, no. I'm gonna hit a grounder. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the Ghost Dance was one. Yeah, and uh, Hugo Wolf that I mentioned earlier that was one. Um, eventually, there's some others. I I can't. God's so okay. We got time, man. To, uh, to, to, eventually, we we led up to uh, Three Legged like Dog. Yeah, and Zen Dudes in the Universe, which were you know those were uh, those were pretty sweet. Oh, Hat City Ramblers. There we go. Hat City Ramblers was an important thing, at least for my music, because now we get. Uh, now you get me, Donnie Piero, um, Brenton Vaughn, another local musician, artist, tattoo artist, yeah, all around good fella, and uh, 
you get me and him together and we share a love of old country music and Americana. And now all of a sudden we have this really loud folk rock punk band. And, uh, and that, and that was like, we played cousin Larry's all the time. It was, you know, that was, we were like kind of, uh, Almost regular. like a house band. Almost, yeah. yeah. Like in one way or another, those guys, you know, were were kind of the house musicians for that place, and for also O'Brien's kind of too. We played O'Brien's a lot back, back really? then. So that goes deep. Your connection, I know connection, you're, yeah. you know, booking there now, and there you yeah. you guys had always played there even before the fire before and like the, the restorations yeah, and things. Exactly. Um, so you were. This was even deeper than that. We used to play there a lot. We used to play Sunday shows there, mm-hmm. and which was great. And those those were. You know, you got to give it up to some of these uh, bar owners. They're essentially sports bars and yeah. a bunch of long-haired, tattooed people come in and are like, hey, can we start playing uh, some rock and roll in here? <laughs> and for them to just to be like, yeah, okay. You're like, that's pretty awesome on them, you know? Yeah. Like, that's not, that's certainly not a safe bet. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Well, it does seem like a lot of sports bars do have the music. You know, like maybe that's what Billy Beans was, was a sports bar of sorts before. You, you know, know what it is? Is that musicians come in and they find they find the bars that are failing. <laughs> that have no other you choice. You guys look like you could use some help. Nothing to lose. Yeah, it's like, it's, yeah, it's some um, exploitation is really mm. what it is. <laughs> Don't give all our secrets away. <laughs> No, we're encouraging growth. And you see the chart. The line goes up. You see? So, uh, okay, so you, you, you got the Ramblers going. Ramblers are killing it. And, Ramblers and, are killing it. So Cousin Larry's is up and jumping. Open mic is killing it. Um, yeah, and then Tony Acabellos comes in with Sub Rosa and starts bringing in, you know, uh, what was Sub Rosa. national acts, uh, yeah. you know, band. That's when I really sunk into the scene. That's when I was going by Hazard Yellow. Yep. Yeah. They were getting some some big bands. At in that point, Cousin Larry's had bands almost every night. Yeah. You know? It's funny. I never went across the street. I was never into Cousin Larry's. Really? I don't think I, I, don't think I ever stepped foot in it. I used to go to all of them. I'd go to Larry's and, and the same night. I'd go to Larry's, Hat City, and... Uh, My dad played at Cousin Larry's. Tuxedo Junction. I, I believe possibly that. with Joey V. Who knows? Oh, I believe that. Yeah, yeah I was probably doing sound. <laughs> <laughs> I was probably hiding outside. <laughs> Looking for plateaus uh, in yeah. the parking lot. It's climbing a plateau in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh okay, so then Larry's was the place that had music pretty much every night of the week. Was that yeah, sort of once, like a hug once, for... t- once Tony got his hands on it, it was in music all the time. Now, yeah. where did he come from? What was his background? Did he do... Did he, he play music? Or was he just a, a, he was a, in a fan? Band. He was, yeah, he's, uh, he's a musician. He's a singer in a band called Big Top Low. And I believe oh, yeah. Cousin Larry, Larry Stromiello, was uh, the guy who... I think he helped them make their record. I mm-hmm. think he maybe put up the money. Oh, or, he did a recording or he just funded it, you mean? F- I think he helped fund it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and maybe like let them do shows there to raise I, I don't know that. So he was announced. a patron he, of the arts in he, one way. Yeah, he was a he f- fulfilled a philanth- philanthropic role mm. in the recording of Big Top Low's record, I think. Yeah. I, I, the, again, a lot of plateaus, you know, yeah. so it's, I don't Sorry. quote me on any of this. We, we don't have to get, get bogged down in that. We'll start building ladders soon, and we'll get over the plateaus. Like if, if somebody wants to correct us in any of this stuff, please feel free to comment yeah. and, and give us the truth. We're all connected now, yeah. so we yes. can all talk. Yeah. Absolutely. We're building plateaus with ladders and rope swings and maybe some zip lines between them. And we're, 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 and at that time, so at that time, you could go see bands. Zip like, line across the street. To, you could. Yeah. I mean, we should have done that, we, yeah. you know, from the building, from the tops of buildings. We could have arranged that. Yeah. Just plateau to zip line to plateau and then right. make the next spot. Yeah. And there's no reason to drive. Tuxedo Junction had good stuff going on yeah. uh, every once in a while. They also had a lot of garbage going on, but yeah. but then they had that little front bar, the Monkey Bar, which was mm-hmm. pretty happening. Um, it yeah, was stay cool. a little close to the mic. And My get... fault. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we want to make sure we're picking up your knowledge. So there was a lot. A lot yeah, you of could you could bounce on. around to three or four different bars, yeah. and you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but if you compare it to what's going on now, it's. Uh, Dismal now. What happened? It's like a dream. That's the question I have for you. What do you think happened? Like, what? Where did all that go? 
I think, yeah, I don't think the city Danbury really knows how to embrace like the artistic community the right way. You know, they yeah. they like that. It's maybe that maybe they're a little controlling about it or something. Also, landlords, you know, don't necessarily want a bunch of shows going on you know i know that cousin larry's people lived upstairs Mm -hmm. and that and you know i'm sure they were pretty unhappy with live bands playing underneath them seven nights a week yeah um but yeah i think it's just like the town didn't really know how to embrace it the did you see they're still they're they're working on it man they're still i don't want you know i don't want to cut them out no, no, but this is important to understand. Like, if you saw something happening and then something changed, like, did you see it changing? Or I mean, yeah. was it all a surprise to I mean, anybody? when you're talking about people offering to help and nobody wants your help. Well, you know, the actual artists in the community are offering their services and and nobody cares, you know. Mm-hmm. It's that There's plenty of that going on. Um, Tony Iacobellis, the Sub Rosa guy, he put on some festivals on the green in Danbury. Like the gas ball festivals safe, safe, or no? No, safe to swim after okay. gas ball. Gas ball was before that, um, but uh, and they would and they would mess with him. You know, they would tell him approve his. Sta- he had a second stage once. They approved whatever his plan was or whatever the stage they built was. It was all good. And then like the day of the show, they're like, "Oh no, we were wrong. You can't use this stage. You have to pay this company that." We happen to have their number, and like, oh. and it's gonna cost you this much. And oh, by the way, you need to pay, you know, eleven cops to be on the grounds today, and they cost sixty dollars an hour, like, you know, like stuff like that. So like, they put roadblocks. Last in the way. minute roadblock, you know, like not not helpful to. Yeah. And, and it's and it comes from just a mistrust of a general mistrust of youth and subcultures of people. Where people. does that come from? Do you think? Like, why do some places That's... have something going on? Like, what what makes that shut down? You know, is you know, it because it's part of Fairfield County? And there's some like beholdenness to. No, I think this is a problem that exists in other places. I mean, it's always existed. Yeah. You know, and it's all it's always when you don't understand what people are doing. Yeah. You know. Uh, they the the older generations will outcast the younger generations little sub cultural things you know right as as just so you saw stu- stupid stupid youngsters you know yeah but these certain cities embrace it uh, Bridgeport has embraced has embraced uh, the artistic culture and live music scene they have a uh, Reed's Art Space which is a really cool uh, place where people can live and also put their uh, they got galleries in there and music studios and all sorts of stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like... Do you think like... they're looking for more solutions there? Is, it, is this part of... Yeah, and not to slight anything, but what you said about musicians found the failing sports bars and tried to help out. Is it is that what... Bridgeport is a, is a city is sort of the failing sports bar of, like, failing, oh, of Fairfield we, County. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I'm trying to be might, smart, man. I might, might be a total idiot. Something. You can you can uh, hmm. shoot me down. I don't know, man. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I think your metaphor is. <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna another plot yeah I think you're fine with that metaphor I think it's gonna, I'm not gonna take anything away from that yeah <laughs> so what's what, what what's going on now man let's talk about now what are you doing now I know you I mean you, you host the open mics you're, you're going back and forth between here and LA what's up with Jonathan Chapman now here and now playing shows um you mentioned uh yeah LA I go, I go to LA a lot what's going on out there talk a bit about that Fill people what, in on what you're doing. Out there. <laughs> I heard they're gonna fall into the ocean soon, right? As a matter of fact, fires. Are you part of that fire? There, it's Did you just, start that fire? It's it's just a molten <laughs> ball. <laughs> it's just a molten ball tumbling into the into the ocean. Yeah. And you want to be there for the grand finale? I'm be riding that uh, <laughs> riding that fire. ghost train. <laughs> yeah. So what's hanging up out there? ten on the lake of fire, baby? Like Bill Hicks said. <laughs> So what's up out there? What are you doing out there? What, what brings you um, out there? Uh, there's some music out there that I've been... A little bit? No? Like, <laughs> yeah, music in L.A. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine uh, is a producer out there who uh, works with a lot of different artists, rap artists, R&B artists, uh, me. And, uh, 
And <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. <sighs> mm. Relax. The lava lamp's going good now. It's bubbling. It's percolating. Nice. Um, so yeah, I go out there and uh, work with my buddy Rich Perry. He's um, part of a music group called Blended Babies. Look them up. They're great. Um, he produces a lot of great stuff, and I'm out there trying to just get on get on other people's tracks, pretty mm -hmm. much playing guitar, keys, uh, singing, backup, oohs and ahs, whatever. So it's more um, studio work stuff? Or are you like yeah, composing, yeah. arranging? Is it like a, a kind of a wherever I'll fit, I'll go? Sometimes me and me and uh, me and Rich will work out beats together. We'll make stuff together. Sometimes I'll just add some guitar to something he's been working on. Sometimes we'll record a uh, song of mine. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're doing my stuff too. That's yeah. Kinda... So you got some new tracks coming out soon? Got, dude, we've recorded I think over fifty songs in Whoa. the past. In the over the past. Yeah, two or three years. And when are they coming out? Does any, uh, is anybody allowed to hear any of these things anytime there soon? There is a uh, there's an EP coming out. There's no date yeah. right now, you know. So I'm going back there to try to put the you know put the nail in that coffin yeah. uh, in a few weeks. How did you get going out there? Like, what 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 uh did you know him from the East Coast or how did you end up? Yeah, he's a homie. He's yeah. from he's from here. Uh, went to high school together. Oh. And uh, in middle, I mean middle school, and uh, yeah, and uh, he went to music school in Chicago. Got into the business. Ended up in L.A. I think he was either hanging out or talking on the phone with a with a mutual friend of ours, my buddy Jared Case, who is a world class chef and all around cool guy. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorite people. Um, they were talking. My name came up. I think they found a video of me playing a, playing a Bob Dylan song on YouTube. Uh, I think we chatted a little bit on the phone, and and Rich took this YouTube video of me playing this Dylan song. Tonight I'll be staying here with you. I was singing it and playing piano, and uh, he like kind of chopped it up and made a made like a beat out of it. Yeah. And made, made a new track out of it, oh, okay. and um, sent it to me. And I thought that was great, and that kind of. Sparked a got the ball rolling, yeah. The working uh, relationship, and he was coming out to um, New York every once in a while at that time. So we would meet up and record stuff here. And then once he was pretty much uh, full time out west, I just started flying out there whenever I could and um, driving. I dr drove out there a couple times too, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. Going I recommend. Country, man, I huh? recommend to anybody that hasn't driven across America, you should do it. You should drive around this country because it's huge and awesome. Yeah, there's like a, so much to see here, like terrain wise and landscape wise, that yeah. I personally don't have a huge urge to go to another country until I've seen all of this one. I feel that way. Like maybe one yeah. day I'll, I'll want to travel more abroad, but my, I feel like there's so much to see here that I don't want to go maybe with the passport. Maybe we need to take next stage on the road, man. Yeah, we should get a big <laughs> bus with like a cow skull on the front, I think. Maybe this could, be some from big, uh, this could be some big, you know, uh, acid test, you know. You can get a bus. Plateau and... test, you mean? Yeah. Uh, you said it. <laughs> I, I, I was going to let that oh, one sorry. slide away. <laughs> <laughs> we could do them from, we could do the, uh, you could do a podcast from venues. Yes. Yeah. You could go see a band, yeah. interview the band. Shh, dude, this is our business plan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> give all our secrets away. <laughs> anyway, no, no, go. anyway, I got a list of I got a list of we'll talk. We'll I got a, He's got big a list ideas of dumps in the future. across America that you can go that have little stages in them where you could go do your do your thing. Oh, that would be great on the road, You're casting with, on the road, man. huh? You're coming with. So. I, I'm always down, man. I'm always down. I don't do anything else, so that's 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 the one thing about being, uh, you know, there's a certain freedom about being. Uh, not really caring about anything and yeah. <laughs> except for playing music <laughs> because you don't really feel I'm too bo too boxed in like, right yeah i'm digging that so yeah like i like going to la it, i like getting away from here um uh you know the weather's nice there i really like the food uh, seeing how the other half lives realizing you know there's something more beyond this because fairfield county is a very bizarre place in the world yeah. to live 
you know, even in the country, it's like it's pretty strange. But the Northeast, though, is is uh, is awesome. Like, like I I have a, definitely have a have a a real deep love for this area. Yeah. Well, I remember going to school in South Carolina and like, then went out come home and the smells of like like the deciduous forest like I didn't have down there. There's some, you know, just the, the, the dirt, earthy, leafy smells that yeah, I didn't have reg- down regenerative there. Regenerative growth. Yeah, there was something yeah. that, that all of a sudden when I when like inhaled, I'm like, oh, I missed that. I didn't know I missed Pine that. trees. <laughs> like when I'm, if, when I'm out in uh, California, I in Southern California, like I'm... I miss pine trees yeah. and just like, you know, bodies of water. You just outside of the ocean. The you know? Pacific Ocean. <laughs> I mean, it's a little... But like when you're driving around, like it's, you, you don't realize how weird you feel. Like it's just the stuff that you're used to because yeah. you, it's been around you your whole life, you know? So right. you miss so it's you like miss little visual things. cues that make you feel like yeah. comfortable, center, or just, they're just not there. And everybody talks about, you know, you miss food when you're away from home. Yeah. You know? They miss uh, bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches. <laughs> but they don't do that out there? Not really. Not yeah. like they do here. But you know what they do have? What do they have? A wide Bre- a wide variety of specialty donut shops. Oh, we chatted a bit about this I on know. the drive here, man. I know. You're a donut fiend from what I, I understand. I am eating donut holes <laughs> off camera. Well, can, <laughs> why don't you eat a few on camera? There's no plateaus involved there. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah man you can get like a red velvet donut double dipped in chocolate like they dip it once cool let it down it cool. let it cool down they dip it again mm. uh, come on man double dip <laughs> come on man now is that the real reason why you're going out to la you're for not really donuts. recording you're just going for the for donuts. donuts and burritos <laughs> it, it, it doesn't uh, hurt well uh, donuts and burritos brought and to play the music with your brother yeah i play i i always try to hang out with him and play some guitar with him and jam and it's so cool that like you're able to uh, you know link up with him and like crash at his place when you're out there yeah oh, it's know? awesome it's like it, it's so any, anytime you know that I, I call him and he says oh johnny was out to visit and like he's hung out and we were watching fantasia or whatever <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's so like uh <laughs> comforting to know that there's like that you know, East Coast, West Coast swap happening with my brother and, totally. and a good friend of mine, like sharing that uh, it's, it's experience. Super rad. It's nice to have a couple, a handful of buddies out there because usually I'm, you know, I'm out there recording pretty much all the time yeah. uh, with Rich. You know, like we, you know, from morning till night, just uh, get the mics going and the MIDI controller and some guitars and some whatever. Gadgets, yeah. plateaus, gizmos. Yeah. Um, and We've used that word so many times. <laughs> it's a good song. The Plateau <laughs> Podcast, <laughs> episode ten, plateaus <laughs> with Jonathan Niles Chapman. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. All right, that's nice. Deep thoughts so, um, with Jack Handy. <laughs> Let's. Uh, uh, what, what, what time are, are we looking at here? Uh, we are uh, still a little over an hour and a half. Okay, so um, let's 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 get into uh, a oh, few. I was gonna clothes. say it's a good break to see your brother from like from recording. I can go like, oh, hang yeah. out with a buddy in this. Have like, a break from the studio. Yeah, yeah. Have a couple beers and like yeah. watch Fantasia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I want to get like uh, you know a little more personal of like you know we're probably gonna wrap up soon, but like what are the things that really uh, turn you on to music and attract you to it, and why you want to do it? Like what is the thing about playing music performing that you said that's for me what can i leave behind to other people what is that wait what in terms of why (laughs) why do you want to play music why do okay that's what i thought in terms of like I assume that you, I, you got something from the music you're listening to. I don't, know, about, I don't know if leaving anything behind has anything to do with it, though. I, or, or it just what, I don't feel like I have a... I've never felt like I had a choice, really. Yeah. From the, like, from, like, those... No, no, I meant, like, leaving, like, recorded music behind for other people to listen to. Like, the bands we listen to... Mm-hmm. Even though what do I want to say with that music? Yeah, like if it's going to be there forever, like what is there an inspiration to that? Because it's like there's bands. I, I hope listen somebody to that I says don't... this doesn't suck. Yeah. I, I, like I like I hope if somebody hears it and is like, oh, this is good. Yeah. Oh, this is good. 
So you you just feel like <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. All right. Oh, leave that on. Leave that. Jonathan on. Nell Chapman. <laughs> he was good. That's <laughs> good. But uh, uh, what what dream? Fire to up the... a plateau and turn it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> cry. <laughs> but oh, what man. drew you to the music that you were listening to when you were first starting and then getting inspired? And like, do you feel that you want to, tr- you know, translate any of that to the next generation of people? Like, what what is the con- continuum of music that you d- do you feel any part of that? Mm, uh, I don't think I don't think so. I don't think yeah. I think about it that way really. Yeah. I just want to put it out there. Yeah. I, I I also really enjoy it. A lot of it is is selfish. It's for me, you know, um, an inability to learn other skills. Uh, you know, it, being a musician, you you have the luxury of being like, I'm an artist, man. You don't you don't understand. <laughs> you know. Right. So you know, I fall. I can fall back on that. <laughs> <laughs> but does it do it must do something for you personally because as I said in the beginning of this after you played that song which you're going to play another one after this um, you go somewhere else like do you do you feel you go somewhere else or is that just my perception of you like is there no, some definitely. other place you go to and is that is that therapeutic for you I try to be in the song you know rather than uh, if I have to think about it too much it's not working you yeah. know um, that's why I'm not big on set lists, really. Um, sometimes it's a good <laughs> idea, but I'm not really big on set lists when I'm playing with the band. Key of E. A lot of times, so, uh, yeah. I love playing with this, it. So you mean you Jesse was Jesse feel... was in my band, and our we had a band together, <laughs> yeah. and and uh, yeah, a lot of it is like you just pick a key. <laughs> and just kind of go in and out. Of so you have to feel. <laughs> The connection of like what you're gonna go into, yeah. And is it is it? Do you That's find yourself staying f- in a space that you're like you get there like and you you're, hang there? You're, you're not really doing much more than just tapping into an existing energy, you know. And I think the same thing goes for writing a song. Like I don't really think if it, if it works, if it really works, it, it you don't have to put a ton of effort into it. You just kind of like. It just happens, and all of a sudden you jot it down, and it's just like it came to you easy, easily. You know, I think that's really how good songs are written. You're, t- it's, it's, it's like it's already there. Yeah. You know, um, and you just and you're kind of uncovering it. Yeah, you, yeah, you've, you found it. You know, you just like you, you're able to just like unlock that frequency. You yeah. know, and uh, and I think the same thing for playing a song. You know, you gotta, you gotta connect to whatever. I think that. Uh, for, Frequency, for lack of a better term, you know, mm-hmm. can exist in the room you're playing in. If you're playing in a in a bar, or a small venue, and you can get a good gauge of what the room is feeling, mm-hmm. tap into that. So you're playing off of what you're getting too, like you, you get something from the room and the people, and then definitely get it's def- there's definitely yeah you, you there's something else to pay attention to more than just like the song mm-hmm. or the or the instrument or yeah. So there's like a different level of interaction that you get your mind or, or, or expose your mind to I don't know how you want to put it but there's something else you're playing with this beyond the physical I'm doing this with the instrument I'm doing this with my voice there's some other exchange as soon as you find like somebody is like really paying attention to you and really into it that's I think that's all it takes for you to like snap into it yeah like very often like you'll look to like the back of the room and there'll be you know, if I'm playing like a playing like a, O'Brien's, I play like an Irish song, and there's some old Irish dude in the back, like getting drunk, but he's like staring a hole through me, like singing along with the song or something. So you know you're reaching him. I know I'm reaching at least one, you know, one some knucklehead out there. But that's enough. Yeah. But that's enough because you because like isn't that magic? Then all of a sudden you're encouraged and like and and like it just opens that. That door, like a, a little wormhole, bit. almost yeah. like, and people uh, respond to that energy too. Yeah, like you know, uh, that's why uh, you know, if one person claps, everybody else claps. You mm-hmm. know, nobody wants to be the first one to clap, though. Like at the end of a song or something, you know, it's or if one person laughs, everybody else starts laughing. Uh, that's that's the same There's thing. There's a certain theater to it, almost. It's like invisible theater, though. Yeah, it's like nobody talks about it. Yeah. Or, you, or you just have to kind of pay, pay attention to see it. 
And so you 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 experience that and you pick up on that. And some do you notice when you like snap into that mode? And sometimes does it not happen? Or definitely doesn't happen. Sometimes sometimes yeah. if you're playing in a in a place where like the vibe <laughs> is just bad. You're definitely background music. Yeah. Then I then I don't the even passion just. Pfft. Yeah. Then I typically I don't even stop in between songs. Like I'll just do one song and the next, and I yeah, I know what I, I'm here for. I'm, I'm playing them. I won't even yeah, I won't even give an opportunity for applause at that point because yeah. I, I know what I'm there for. I'm just a I'm a You're just sonic wallpaper. I'm a radio. Yeah, I'm a, a live breathing radio, and people like to have that. Yeah, in restaurants and stuff. That's kind of the functionality of it, but there's something more uh, uh, sacred when you get that connection as you said even if it's just one person is that what you like live for with it is it's the oh, performance definitely. so that makes sense when i said oh what do you want to leave behind You're like well nothing no it's about the doing a performance it, not the... i want to leave behind a good performance yeah and i want to make good records I, I you know there's nothing better than making an awesome recording an awesome song that makes you feel good and makes you feel fulfilled but it's not the same because you don't get to experience the person who's listening to it i'd much rather leave behind a good performance yeah you know in front of an audience right i was just in la for five weeks and i only got into in front of an audience once and i felt weird i had weird uh anxiety like the whole time i was there because i there was this you know i'm used to i'm used to doing it three, four, or five nights a week. So it's like... Was it that you felt like you were out of practice? Or did you think the LA audience was more like judgy and like not really... I just didn't have any like... gigs. I just didn't have any oppor- a lot of opportunities. No, no, but I mean like why th- th- that feeling happened there? Was it because the audience was weird? Or was it because you hadn't played in a few days? It was because I, haven't been pl- I hadn't played so in front of people. So you hadn't purged enough. It felt great the one time I played in front of an audience. Yeah. That was great. And, and they like me. Do you think there's like a certain threshold that like you need to play so many times per week to keep that like threshold at bay where you don't feel uh, too anxious about it? I think it's just like it's an uh, uncontrollable urge. Yeah. A compulsion. Yeah. A plateau. Yeah. Devo style. So you're born to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, before we check out of here, we got to get one more tune from you if you're down for it. Yeah. Let's let's do one more tune from Mr. Tunage. Jonathan Chapman. Woo. Episode ten. We've covered so much, so much ground here, from spooky railroads to plateaus to you know. We the, can the, talk the, a lot of. We should, we're gonna have stages. to do. Uh, oh, there's gonna be more. We're gonna than have this. to do part two. Oh, this is not, <laughs> this is just the introductory episode. Yeah. Just climbing um, the plateau. So let's let's uh, maybe I'll, I'll put this mic a little bit back further and get it get it down in a good position. Yeah, man, we missed a lot. We didn't even talk about. Uh, Oh, My dude. days as a reggae bass player. <laughs> you gotta save it for the next episode. This is this is not gonna be the last episode oh, by any stretch of the imagination. Have, probably have you on the summer, yeah, you know, thanks. We're gonna be doing the, next week, yeah. the pool casting by that point. Yeah. Up by the pool. Maybe. If we work it out. Maybe. You think that's a... That's a... That's, a, that's definitely happening. Some operation you got here. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so high class. We're talking about pool casting. We can't get the table cast. You're going to get electrocuted in the pool. You think, is that a good... That should be a good position, right? It's fine. All right. What does Jesse think? He's the uh, he's the producer. Sounds yeah. good. Looks good. Yeah, he's, he's giving me the uh, cut it thing <laughs> right now. You can't see it on, off camera. So, uh, what are you going to sing us out with here? You're just doing one? You can do as many as you would like. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> um. This is what it takes To get a solid for sure, put all the things that I love in the trouble. Sleep in your bed. I must crawl across your floor. No, I don't think I want to get solid no more. That you want 
Till my pen is out of ink And I'll strong till my fingers are bleeding Till your heart is not needing A song that I no longer sing You know what? I loved that record. That uh, uh, um, Bone was it called? Bone, yeah, yeah by Three Legged, Legged Dog. Dog. I listened to that record like every day at work for an ex- almost a year straight. That That's... and then Nirvana's Bleach, like back to back. But I, <laughs> those tunes are like, ingrained in my head. I love that song. Thank I'm you for in, coming. I'm, on. I'm in good company then. Yeah. With that record. <laughs> Well, dude, thank you for coming on. This is not going to be the last one. This is the introduction. Nope. Episode 10, Jonathan Chapman. Episode first, 10. Woo, first performer <laughs> on the podcast to be playing acoustic and singing. Nobody better. Yes. Excellent time. Thank you for coming out. And we'll see. <laughs> we'll see all of you soon. Any last words to the people? Or let's just cut it there. Or Love each other. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Tip your bartender. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see y'all soon, or we'll, you, you will hear us and see us. We won't see you because we can't see you. But we love you all. <laughs>